recording. So good afternoon, everyone. This is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester, and I coordinate the Cornell University Forest Connect program. One part of that is this monthly webinar series, the third Wednesday of every month. We are treated to uh, the treat is usually when it's somebody other than me, and today is just such a day. We're joined by Dr. Sheldon Owen, who's an extension, the Extension Wildlife Specialist at West Virginia University. We've had um, some of Sheldon's colleagues in the past have done a great job, and I met Sheldon at a meeting last fall and offered him this opportunity, and he was eager to, to uh, participate. So I'm going to let Sheldon, uh, will give a bit more of his background, but Sheldon's going to be joining us today and talking about the habitat needs and management for the monarch butterfly. So Sheldon, thank you. I'm going to mute my microphone and look forward to your presentation. Appreciate you joining us. Awesome, Peter, and thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to be with you here today via the internet. Thanks for logging on and joining in with us today. Uh, this is a you know an interesting group. After I met Peter and he was talking about this side of this northeast forestry uh, group, uh, it, as you hear me talk today, you'll realize I really don't sound like I'm from the northeast. Uh, originally from northeast Mississippi, so maybe that makes me a northeastern in some ways. Uh, but you may hear a bit of a southern accent as I talk today. Um, you know, from Mississippi, went to Mississippi State University. I uh, got a degree in forestry and wildlife management, and Went on to University of Georgia, worked with forest dwelling bats, uh, and then couldn't, didn't know when to quit, so came up here to West Virginia University, got a PhD looking at raccoon ecology, uh, again in an intensively more, uh, managed uh, forest management uh, regime. Um, and, and so I'm now back as the Extension Wildlife Specialist here. And so my background is in kind of in forestry and, and wildlife management, specifically in some mammals, uh, but I've sort of been drug into the uh, pollinator habitat management world uh, by my wife, who is one of the co-authors, if you will, co-presenters on this presentation, Sarah Owen, who is a, uh, a pollinator specialist for the NRCS and West Virginia Division of Natural Resources, and, and her colleague, Sue Alcott, uh, also working with uh, West Virginia Division of Natural Resources. You know, I, I enjoy the, the component of managing habitat, managing the landscape, and making changes out there to benefit whatever wildlife species we may be uh, working with or involved in, and so uh, this was a lot of fun for me, but I do not have a background in entomology, which has made it even more interesting trying to learn uh, a whole new group of, of individuals and, 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 and tacks as we go through this. So this is fun. So we'll, we'll talk today a little bit about the monarch butterfly, its habitat requirements, and some issues going on with monarch populations across its range, and also some habitat management uh, practices that we can put in place. You know, we as landowners can put in place to help benefit not only monarch butterflies, but other pollinators and other wildlife species as well. So let me make sure my advance button will allow us to move forward, and it does. So why are we talking about pollinators? Why are they so important? Uh, you know, if you're sitting there eating your lunch today, uh, many of the quotes you'll hear is one out of three bites that you take is, is actually pollinated by insects. And so it's very important out there on the landscape that these insects are playing this ecological role in, in, in pollinating the food sources and flowering plants there across the, the landscape. So more than 85% of our flowering plants need pollinators uh, to reproduce. You know, a third of our food is pollinator dependent. And looking just here in the United States, you know, insect pollinated crops account for about $30 billion annually. You know, looking at some numbers, that's about 200, and 200 billion, 218 billion across the, the globe. So very important to our, to our economy, very important to our, our, our uh, the ecosystems that we live in, and especially our food systems out there. So all pollinators are important, and, and definitely we have some issues in terms of their decline. So, so what's going on with our pollinators? Um, you know, there are threats coming from all sides in a lot of cases. Our honeybees are in trouble. Uh, some of the stats, a 50% decline in hives since 1950. Looking uh, across our pollinator species, you know, 40% of those native insect pollinators are facing extinction. That's a, that's a big word right there. They're not threatened. They're just facing extinction, the loss of these species. Uh, 150 species of butterflies are at risk. And what kind of got me involved in, in uh, bringing me into the pollinator world, I guess, is the, is the monarch butterfly. And if you look at its population status over the past two, three decades, we've lost over 80%. You know, some reports are 70 to 90% of, 
loss in our population just over the past two decades. Um, and we'll focus a little bit more on monarch butterfly. We'll use that sort of as the model because, hey, the things that we're doing for monarch butterfly will also benefit other species. But this is that iconic species where uh, if you can remember back, I'm uh, trying to think back to my eighth grade biology lessons when we're talking about metamorphosis, this, this change in, in, um, in structure and also migration, the monarch butterfly was a great model for that because it is one of our only North American you know, migratory species that are out there. It's a very phenomenal migration pattern that they exist. And it's a great model to actually see this thing metamorphose from growing from an egg to a caterpillar to a butterfly. And so it's it's a great iconic species. And I think we can all, you know, picture a time when we've seen this out there on the landscape and, and think that we may be losing this species uh, is definitely an issue out there. Um, because of these declining species, it's now been proposed as listing as an endangered species. So about 2014, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was petitioned to actually list this as an endangered species. And so they've been going through habitat reviews and gathering information from biologists and entomologists and habitat managers and states all across its range uh, to try to develop a plan and what do we need to do? How do we list this? And how do we protect and conserve this species? So we haven't seen the final ruling on that yet, but it is under consideration for listing. Hopefully this year, I think I've heard reports of maybe December. So maybe we get lucky and get some information out this summer how Fish and Wildlife Service will actually list this and what that means to land managers across the U.S. Uh, and so it could have some significant impact, especially for agricultural communities and, and landowners like you. So definitely important to keep an eye on this. And this is something where, you know, we can make a difference. We can make a change and, and actually promote and conserve this species. So a little bit more about the, the monarch butterfly again, because it is that, that, that iconic, look at that charismatic orange and black butterfly, a relatively large butterfly that is out there. Only migratory species, you know, this is uh, only migratory butterfly in North America in terms of making that long two-way distance migration back and forth. Other butterflies do migrate to some extent in, in, in local areas moving, uh, moving across the landscapes. But this is the only one that really makes that two to 3,000 mile journey. Uh, you know, this, is, this species is widespread across the United States. We've kind of broken it down into, into two different groups. Same species, but we have those that are west of the Rocky Mountains, which is our western uh, monarch butterfly, and they sort of spend their summers uh, throughout the western United States and they migrate down to the coastal California, uh, and down into Baja, and to spend their winters. And then you go in east of the Rocky Mountains, and it's kind of this eastern population of, of monarch butterflies that travel all the way down. You know, they go up from Canada and travel all the way down into central Mexico, the high elevation of the fir forest, to overwinter. We do have a small population down in the, in the southeast United States, down in Florida, that kind of overwinter in Florida, not really a large migrating species, a migrating population, but uh, still fascinating, you know, distance that this small little butterfly is going to cover each year down and back. What adds to that phenomenon is the fact that this is not one individual flying down and back, but the, the total migration takes multiple generations of, the, of these individuals. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. And so I, again, this adds to the to, to the, the glamour of this species. And so it's, it's a very cool species and one that, that we can take action in in conserving this out there. Um, some of those points to the side, again, only migratory butterfly. Uh, they're larger, are species specific in terms of what they feed on. So they need those milkweeds, uh, Asclepia species to actually feed on um, in, in overwintering down in central Mexico. Uh, so we talked about this, this migration coming from the upper Canada, the United States, the Midwest, down into Mexico. So the fall, in the fall of the year, those adult monarch butterflies will fly down over winter in central Mexico. And then around March and April, if you look at this graph here, see if I can get my mouse, look at this graph here. About March and April, they start, those that overwintered in Mexico will start flying north and coming up into Texas. They will breed, lay eggs, and then they'll die. And so their offspring will then start the migration pattern coming back north. So that first generation, you know, leaving Texas and in, in, in the south United States, starting moving up into the Midwest and up into the northeast United States. Um, and so it takes multiple generations. So here in the northeast, it may be the third or fourth generation. So the great, great, great grandchildren of those that migrated last year that we're gonna be seeing in the fall of, uh, of this year that, that make that return trip. So multiple generations making this, this migration path, pathway uh, possible is pretty interesting. If you look at this, you know, we've got, we're, we're starting to see here in West Virginia, 
we're starting to see you know, monarch butterflies show up around June, July, and then really a big pulse in late July and August of those monarchs showing up here, breeding, laying eggs, and starting that, that migration path uh, back down to Mexico. So uh, if we're thinking about when should we start managing for uh, uh, monarch butterflies or even pollinators, now those are those key areas to make sure that we have flowering plants out there. They're the key times that we have flowering plants out there in the landscape, June, July, and August. But again, there are other pollinators that are out there year round, or specifically from spring into the fall, that need these flowering plants. And so having those flowering plants on the landscape throughout that time, very important, uh, not only conserving monarch butterflies, uh, but many other pollinators as well. So looking a little bit about the, about the biology, what's, again, the migration path of this is, is pretty phenomenal. Multiple, multiple generations making this migration back and forth. But you also look at, at the biology and the, and the growth of the species. And so these adult females laying, you know, a few hundred eggs, most of them lay one egg on one individual milkweed out there. Three, four days that egg will hatch. Uh, and then it's, it goes through several instars as a, an actual larval caterpillar uh, that you see here. And so that larva is feeding on those milkweed species, growing, and it's growing in size from, you know, this pin head size egg into maybe a two, two and a half inch uh, caterpillar growing you know, over 2,000 times its body size over that, let's say 10 to, let's say it says here 11 to 18 days, so 10 to 15 days, and then it goes into a chrysalis where it metamorphoses into that adult butterfly stage. And so going from a, a tiny pinhead set size egg growing into a two inch caterpillar and then metamorphosing into an adult uh, butterfly, just a phenomenal biology, phenomenal model of metamorphosis in this species. So uh, again, something very interesting, neat to see out there on the landscape, not only for you know, the kids that I get to work with in my daily actions, but also the, the adults as well. So again, showing you some pictures here. And any of these pictures that you see that are blurry, those are the ones that I took. Any of those that look very good, those are these professionally made, and hopefully those will, be, will get the credits made there. But these are a couple that I took. Now this is that pinhead size, egg that's been laid on a on leaf of a milkweed species. After three or four days, it hatches out. And again, it takes some good eyesight to actually find these. I've got two young daughters who I take out in the field with me. They're down there about that same height and have much better eyesight than I do. You can actually find these for me. We can start monitoring some of these, these individuals. Um, but as they go through these instars, you know, basically that real small caterpillar, and once they start to grow, they molt. Um, they'll go through five different stages, instar stages, um, before they go into a chrysalis. Um, you see a, a picture of a chrysalis here, spending again 10 to 14 days in that cry chrysalis metamorphosing into the adult species you'll see here, adult individuals you'll see here on the right hand side. So just a phenomenal biological uh, happening going on out there. This, this, this interesting to see. And this is going on all over, you know, the Northeast, all over the United States. And so as we're getting out in the, in the field, hopefully that you are getting out there and enjoying your time in, in, in the field. These are things that you can see. These are things that you can, you can take part in. Um, and we encourage you to do that, uh, making sure that you know, not only we're understanding the species, but we're sharing that information as we go along. So very cool species, unique uh, biological history there, um, and very specific in terms of the habitat that it needs, specific to the vegetation that it needs, because it will only be feeding, the larva will only be feeding on these Asclepia species, the, the, uh, the milkweeds that are out there. I'll throw up three pictures of, of the most common milkweeds that we'll have here in West Virginia and, and up into the Northeast. Common milkweed, swamp milkweed, and, and butterfly weed. These are the ones we'll see. There are multiple other species. We've got another nine species that occur here in West Virginia. Depending on where you are in the Northeast, as, as other milkweeds that these monarch caterpillars can, can, can feed on. Uh, and so Here's our other plug, and here's some homework for you to go out there and start learning and learn how to identify those milkweed species that are, are found in, in your area and, and across your landscape. So you can start not only identifying those, but then sort of conserving those and protecting those because this is what the, the monarch butterfly needs. Because they're going to be laying eggs on these species. The larva, this is what they're going to be feeding on uh, as larva. Uh, as, they, as they grow and, and develop. And so these are very important to the, to the conservation, to the preservation of the species. Without this, we're not going to have that monarch butterfly. And issues come because it is, you can talk to a lot of our farmers and, and maybe you joining us today, look at milkweed as a weed and they're trying to eradicate that from their fields. 
Um, and, and, and so it's, it's, it's sort of a battle out there. And, and that's one of the issues of this decline is the loss of milkweed across the landscape. And so if we're talking to landowners today and say, hey, you know, I notice you have some milkweed out there on your property. Uh, can you protect that for the monarch butterfly? And you know, they've spent years battling it, trying to get it out of their field. And so sometimes it's a hard sell. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story that for the past two years, our the West Virginia 4-H groups across the state have had a theme. Uh, in 2018, it was monarch butterfly. And so individual campers were coming into state and county camps and learning about the monarch butterfly, the natural history of the monarch butterfly. Then this past year in 2019, it was just about pollinators in general. And so, you know, these kids are being exposed to not only learning about the natural history of the butterfly, but also being able to identify some of these species that are important uh, to the conservation of, of our pollinators, in particular the monarch butterfly. And after the, the first year, the kids had all come through camp and they're taking this information and taking it home. I was given a presentation at a local farmers group and, and I was talking just about habitat management in general. And I mentioned, you know, a little plug about the monarch butterfly and how we're conserving milkweed for the monarch butterfly. And this farmer in the back of the group stood up and said, you're the one. I'm like, oh my goodness, what have I done? You know, I, I don't know what I've done, but it sounds pretty bad according to his tone. However, his grandchildren had attended one of the 4-H camps and had come home and talked to him and grandmother and said, hey, you know, these are the species that, these are the milkweed species that we have to protect to save the monarch butterfly. And they were pointing it out in his fields. So he was having to drive around and not brush all and not cut that down and protect those. Again, adding a little bit more work to his day. Uh, but it's great that, you know, they're starting to identify these. These kids were able to identify this and, and, and deliver that information to uh, grandpa and, and, and grandmother. And, and so they actually saved this species and protected some of the species in the field. Uh, but I did get the blame for that. That's okay. I, I got broad shoulders. I can hold a holster that. But uh, uh, it, it was fun to see that and fun to see that impact and that connection is made when people, you know, identify that. The iconic butterfly, they identify the, the, the plant that they need to feed on, and they actually take those steps to protect it. So it was, it was fun to see that, although interesting at the time, he brought it up in the meeting. Um, but not only, you know, definitely our larva species, this is what they're going to be laying their eggs on, this is what the larva caterpillars will be feeding on, but that's not the only thing. Most all of our flowering plants that are out there, if it's large enough, it can, you know, a butterfly can land on it, it can support its weight, and they can actually drink nectar from it. Uh, definitely important out there in terms of fueling, um, fueling the migration path. You know, they're going to need that pollen. They're going to need that food to make that uh, make that uh, trip back down south, or even trips coming back up north. So many of our flowering plants out there across the landscape provide a a food source for for, for monarch butterflies. Not only monarchs, but all of our familiar species out there. So. You know, get to know the, the pollinating flowering plants in your area. These are just a few very common ones that we can see out there. Coneflowers and, and, and daisies, black-eyed Susans, Joe Pye weeds. A lot of these are considered, um, you know, weeds, and, and a lot of farmers are trying to get rid of them out there in their fields, but they're growing naturally and is providing that food source for a lot of our, our, our pollinators. So very important across the landscape if we can just maintain or protect and uh, even promote uh, these, these flowering plants out there across the landscape. So we need those milkweeds. That's, that's, that's an obligate to, to lay eggs on it and for the young to feed on it. But other flowering plants are also very important in terms of making sure they have enough fuel to, uh, to complete this migration, complete the life cycle that they're going through. So issues, concerns, why are, why are we losing the population? Why is it you know, proposed for listing? If you look at how these things are measured. Now, you know, again, this has a nationwide distribution, continent-wide distribution, and it's kind of hard to actually go out there and count each individual butterfly that may be flying across the landscape. So they'll go down into these, these high elevation forests down in central Mexico and start measuring the amount of area that's actually covered with monarchs. And so you'll, you'll walk into these fir forests and just the limbs are sort of hanging with hundreds and thousands of these butterflies hanging on these limbs. Again, they, they probably weigh less or around the weight of a paper clip, but you put a hundred or so together on a limb, and you can actually see some of the uh, the limbs start to bow over some. So it's, it's very interesting. And they're, you know, counting these in, in terms of the amount of area that is covered uh, by monarch butterflies. And so if you look at the left-hand side of the screen here in the mid-90s, we've got seven, 12, 18 hectares that are actually covered uh, with monarch butterflies. Now, you know, 
throw that into some some maybe some area sizes that we are more a little bit more familiar with. You know, that 18.2 hectares uh, in 1996, 1997, overwintering 96 and 97 relates to about 44.9 acres. Think about 44 football fields covered uh, with monarch butterflies. Uh, on average, if you're looking, you know, how many butterflies are actually covered in a, will actually cover a, a hectare? About 27, almost 28 million monarchs can cover that area. So a lot of individuals in these populations cover up, a, you know, kind of a small area, if you will, thinking about, you know, 28 million monarchs per hectare in those areas. Uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating. If you look at the general trend over these, you know, these two decades here, you start to see this downward trend. So we have that sort of the high 1996, 1997 of a little over 18 hectares down to the low in 2013, 2014 of just 0.6 hectares. So we go from, you know, 40, almost 45 acres down to less than two acres in terms of the amount of area covered by um, monarch butterflies. So that's a significant drop in your population. If you're, if you're looking sort of the bright side, you look at you know, that 2017-2018, we had 2.48. You add in 2018-2019, we jump back up 6.5. Now, you know, these individual monarchs, you know, they're Females are laying up to you know three five hundred eggs, and so the population can rebound really quickly because of the amount of reproduction that can go on if all the conditions are right. So we can see these fluctuations in our population, but obviously this, this general trend of decline is one that's, that's worrisome and, and one that I think we uh, all together can combat and, and start uh, maybe a turnaround in, in, in the population status of the species. So what are some of the issues or reasons why we're seeing these declines? One, you know, this, this large portion, this large uh, group that's going down to, to overwinter down in central Mexico, just in the Oromil, the high elevation Oromil for, fir forest. Um, you know, you see here in the black, you see small little areas here that, that are made up of these forests. These are the small areas that they're going to overwinter. So any disturbance that goes on in those areas, specifically during the wintertime, can have significant impacts on the population. Uh, and, and definitely have some issues there. So there's, you may have heard stories of illegal logging going on or destruction of those fir forests. We actually had a couple of uh, researchers and biologists and individuals working those areas were actually killed in the past year. So it's just, uh, you know, some very uh, interesting things going on in those areas there, some significant actions going on. There's maybe uh, areas that are protected, obviously, but, but People are trying to come in and extract some of those resources and have those conflicts arise. So if we have changes in that overwintering habitat, definitely that's going to have a significant impact on the population itself. Um, now, you also look at climate change and how you know, our, our, our weather patterns are changing. That's having a significant impact on the timing of flowering and when these uh, monarch butterflies are, are flying back and migrating back through. Uh, if you look at some of these photos here, uh, you know, in, in spring of, of 2010, you see how pretty, and, and you see the, the, the flower, the food sources they have out there on the landscape move forward to a year. So when these monarch butterflies are coming back in to, to find some fuel sources and, and lay their eggs, or you know, you, you don't see any milkweeds out there to lay on, but we also don't see any food sources out there for them to, to, to fuel up on either. So, you know, the timing of, of when these flowering plants are actually flowering and when the, the, the monarch butterflies and also other insects are emerging and coming through, um, very important in terms of, of making sure those times match up and with having the food source on the ground when those insects are emerging, those insects arrive. Um, so extreme weather patterns, you know, flooding, uh, rain events, uh, strong wind events all have an impact on our, our monarch butterflies. Uh, probably the most significant of that is that loss of breeding range, uh, loss of breeding habitat, the loss of milkweed. Okay. Again, this is considered a weed in a lot of agricultural systems and, and a lot of farmers uh, as we're trying to um, farm cleaner in many ways. You know, we're getting rid of those weeds, uh, that vegetation that is not the crop that we're trying to grow, and we can have significant impact on the loss uh, of that particular plant across the landscape. Um, and, and so we've seen some significant reductions throughout the Midwest and, and even in the Northeast of, of milkweed uh, because of a lot of our Roundup Ready crops. You know, there we can come in and have a clean slate to start growing from and we only have the soybean or the corn that we're trying to grow there and no other weeds and no other plants growing, but those are very important on the landscape. And the loss of that type of vegetation uh, is, is very important. It's, it's not just on agriculture. You can see 
of land use changes. Some of our fields and, and old fields and pastures uh, are now no longer managed or, or no longer work. And so they're, especially here in the Northeast, because Mother Nature's trying to get back to that uh, that forested state, we're losing a lot of that early successional vegetation where our milkweed and these other flowering plants grow, turning into a forest. You know, the shrubs and, and trees, they all, we do have a lot of flowering trees out there that do provide nectar resources for, for insects, um, but we're losing a lot of the areas where we're growing milkweed um, and, and definitely have a significant impact on the population. If we can't feed them or we don't have a place for, for butterflies to lay their eggs and those larvae to grow, um, again, significant impact to the population through that. Uh, also, uh, increased use of insecticides, pesticides, um, not only these neonicotinoids, these systematic um, insecticides. If you go to Lowe's or any home, home garden store, you'll see um, these plants have been treated with a neonicotinoid, a systemic um, insecticide protected against uh, insects. But as um, you know, they are, some of our pollinators and also monarchs are, are feeding on those plants. We're starting to see some of the, uh, the influences and, and, and negative influences it can have, lethal influences it can have on their populations. And so um, loss of milkweed, increased use of pesticides, impacts to the overwintering areas, changing in, in our weather patterns, all having significant impacts and sort of driving our monarch butterfly and other pollinators down in terms of population. Um, so some things we can battle, some things we can fight. Others, uh, you know, it's, it's going to take more than just uh, a simple planting of a milkweed to, you know, to change those. Uh, but there are steps that, that we can take, and there are there are ways that, that we can have a, have an impact out there on the landscape. It's not going to be just one individual, one organization making this change. It's going to take all of us. You know, it's an all hands on deck approach, uh, from, from the smallest you know, backyard gardener to the large agricultural communities. But we can all play a role in, in, in ensuring that we have these flowering plants and, and monarch habitat, pollinator habitat across the landscape. Uh, one to you know, save the, the monarch butterfly and also promote these other pollinators and other wildlife species as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those later. So it's going it's to take us all. Uh, and I think we can, but this is one of those fun things that we can go out there and actually have a, an impact on the landscape. We can make simple changes that can have significant impacts across the landscape and, and, and have great improvement to uh, habitat uh, for many of these wildlife species. And so it's, this is what in, drew me to this, these, these types of projects here in West Virginia. The fact that we can go out there and make some changes and, and for the good um, and, 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 and you know, play that role in conservation for many different species. Uh, so if we're looking at pollinators in general, you know, what, are, what do all of our pollinators need? One of the pollen, they need nectar. They need those flowering plants out there to provide food. Um, they also need some shelter and nesting in overwintering uh, areas, whether that may be bare ground in some cases, and there's still remaining leaf litter in others. Um, and they need protection from, from pesticides. If we look at monarchs specifically, you know, definitely we need that, that milkweed out there on the landscape. If we're looking for food, we're looking for resources. We can make sure we can ensure that the, the milkweeds exist on the landscape and they're protected on the landscape. And we're doing a, uh, doing our part in terms of, of monarch conservation. Um, and you know, every little bit helps. We think I only have maybe a back porch or small area, small little garden. Every little fuel source helps as we start looking at you know these these butterflies as they're moving across the landscape, looking for something to feed on. Don't think well, you know, my area is too small. I don't have enough window boxes. Those those little flowering pots on your front porch can all have an impact and can all and I'll provide a food source for, for monarchs and, and other species as well. Um, most of you know the landscape out there, it's already there. The flowering plants exist. You know they're growing. The sea bank is full of these seeds. In most cases, some of our highly um, in our heavily managed agricultural areas may not you know, may have had uh, sea bank depleted over the years, and we may have to go in and replant. But in most cases, you know, the vegetation is there. We just need to let it grow, let it actually mature, actually go into a flowering plant. I think one of the, the, the major reasons for decline in, in milkweed and a lot of our flowering plants is, is what we'll call recreational mowing. There's people out there mowing for, for mowing's sake. I have to go back and ask my parents. I don't remember a time when I ever just said, I would love to go out and mow the lawn today. I never really got excited about mowing the lawn. As a kid, and I, I don't as an adult either. So, areas where we can just let it 
let it grow, allow that vegetation to grow up. And there, there are many restrictions to that if you're living in neighborhoods and there'd be homeowner association rules and regulations uh, about how high you can allow the grass or vegetation to grow in your area. But again, think creatively in terms of how we can uh, allow this vegetation to grow out there and, and become a, a more messy, if you will, messy environment, a more flowering uh, uh, environment. Uh, I think probably uh, we look at some of the declines. I think the addition of a cup holder on the lawnmower is probably one of our major reasons for decline. If you, you need to have a cup holder in your lawnmower, you may be mowing too much out there. And uh, maybe we can consider <laughs> mowing a little bit less and allowing some of that, that stuff to grow. But there are, there are some drawbacks and some, some obstacles you'll run into as you start thinking about letting that vegetation grow and mature. Um, but a messy, the messier a, a yard, um, the messier an area looks, the more vertical structure you see within the diversity of plant heights and also the diversity of plant species, flowering plants. You know, the messier it looks out there, the better it will be for, for pollinators and for other wildlife species as well. Uh, a major issue that we have here in West Virginia throughout the Northeast is, is basically this carpet of cool season grasses that are they're covering up a lot of our fields. And so, if we were to just allow that to grow, those, those cool season grasses are really inhibiting other plants from growing. It's created this carpet, this prohibiting the seed bank from, from germinating, other plants to grow through it. And so in many cases, if we have you know, small areas out there, we need to actually get rid of that carpet and allow the seed bank to respond um, and, and allow other vegetation to grow into it. You know, if I, if I talk to a lot of farmers and landowners out there that are growing um, grass uh, forage out there for their livestock. And this, is, this is a tough sale and I'm not saying go out and convert all of your fields to pollinator meadows, but where you can and when you can, allow that vegetation to grow up, allow, allow other plants to move in. Um, don't sacrifice your, your highly productive forage areas out there, but in those marginal areas, on the edges, places where you don't graze or you don't hay for, uh, for areas, allow that vegetation to grow and mature, allow those flowering plants to take over, to add that plant diversity and increase the, the amount of flowering plants out there and increase the number of pollinators can feed on those flowering plants out there. Um, but it takes some effort to get rid of that carpet in a lot of cases, and whether it be mechanical in terms of um, chemical control or, or, or burning in some cases, in addition to chemical control, use of herbicides or, or, or disking, you know, it takes some action to break that side up and break that, that carpet of cool season grass up. Um, and, but, but well worth it in terms of creating a more diverse vegetative mix out there and especially the flowering plants. So if we're thinking about, you know, how do we manage this, this vegetation that's out there in the landscape? Again, Mother Nature is trying to take things into a forest here in the Northeast. Our climate, the amount of rainfall that we get, if we don't do anything, you know, the, the grasses that we see today, those flowering plants that we see today, those forbs that we see today, are going to eventually be taken over by woody species and we're going into a forest. Again, you know, some of our woody species do provide great pollinator benefits, but not nearly the amount that our early successional vegetation can, can provide in the landscape. But it takes some action to maintain and keep that early successional vegetation in that stage, whether it be brush hogging, mowing, um, or, or the use of herbicide, maybe disking, breaking up that sod, just allowing that, exposing that seed bank and allowing other seeds to germinate, uh, use of prescribed fire. Even grazing in some cases can, can manage that vegetation, keep that woody uh, vegetation out. Uh, again, the seed bank may be depleted in some cases. I would, I would think first, hey, let's allow the vegetation to grow. It's no cost just to allow the seeds in the seed bank to actually grow. Um, but definitely, it may take some reseeding, you coming in to replant some different, different seed mixes out there to, to introduce these flowering plants into an area. Um, so again, getting rid of that cool season carpet, I may have hit the wrong button here. Uh, to go, went backwards. Um, so looking at that first option, probably one of the most common ways that we manage our early, early successional vegetation is through brush hogging uh, or, or mowing. And, and that's, that's great. It's a way to sit back succession in some cases, but it does promote grasses. And so it really doesn't, if you've gone too far, if you have a lot of shrubs uh, or woody vegetation moving in, it, it basically, basically causes those to sprout and doesn't remove those from that area. And so you may still have a, a woody component issue uh, across these fields if you're not using something to get rid of that woody vegetation or actually set back succession uh, to make sure it's not turning into a, to a woody dominated, woody species dominated field. So uh, if, if you've come in and we've planted something, you may need to actually go in and, and mow the top off of some of those grasses to make sure uh, that they're not dominating and, and overshadowing um, 
out shading, out competing some of the plants that were taking a little bit longer to grow. Um, if we're thinking about, we want to maintain this in early succession. You hear a lot of, a lot of um, individuals talk and promote and doing you know, mowing it every one to three years, put it, getting in on this cycle in terms of when we're actually going to mow it and make sure we're maintaining it in early successional vegetation. Uh, you can also look, and, and you don't have to set it, you know, every two years, every every three years, I'm going to mow it. You can just let the vegetation tell you when you need to mow it uh, and, and when you need to actually come in and change it. And if you're not really seeing a, a, a big shift of woody, you know, woody species coming in, you may not have to mow it on that such regular interval. Or, or it may take, uh, it may have to increase your, your uh, number of times you actually mow it to, to maintain that. So um, definitely be careful when you're out there mowing because it will promote grasses and we definitely want to promote those other flowering plants, those broadleaf plants, um, things as, as they cross the landscape. Uh, even if you uh, need to mow throughout the year, need to, to maintain some of that vegetation, and the timing is, is very important. Uh, you know, depending on when they're going, the monarch butterflies, most pollinators are arriving in your area, we don't want to remove that food source when it's a critical time for, the, for them uh, throughout the year. So you may consider strip mowing or, or strip disking or, or, or just mowing patches uh, so that there are, there are you know, the, still those remaining tall structure, that, that, those flowering plants in, in the area. But then you've also you know, started new plants growing. You have this nice flush of green vegetation coming in. Uh, and so strip mowing can be very important if you see in, in the picture there. That was by accident. We had an individual come into one of our pollinator plots and notice all of the weeds out there. So he decided to go ahead and cut it for us. Um, and that was in mid-June when that occurred, but it did. So we had those mature plants on one side of the field, and now we've got basically plants starting to re, um, regrow on the left-hand side of the field. So we've got young, flush uh, green vegetation coming in on the left, and we had that mature flowering plants on the right. So it it did stagger our the, the vegetative structure that is out there, but also some of the flowering. So now these plants are going to respond and grow and mature uh, and start to flower. And so we have uh, flowering plants throughout the year. So mowing can be quite beneficial in terms of setting it back and, and, and restarting growth. Um, and so to make sure that you have that nice green flush vegetation at different times of the year. Because if, if you allow milkweed plants in particular, common milkweed to grow throughout the year, again, it's going to mature. It's going to you know, produce a, a seed pod, and then it's going to start to senesce. And so that, that's not a good flush green vegetation again. And it may not be the best environment for a monarch to lay its egg and for that larva to actually feed on. If you allow that good green growth of vegetation, flush of vegetation, that can be quite beneficial uh, as well. Uh, it may just take, again, looking at disturbance, it may just take breaking up that, that seed bank, uh, removing or incorporating up to 50, 60 percent of the actual green vegetation into the soil by disc or rototiller to again expose that seed bank and other allow other seeds that are in the seed bank a chance to grow uh, and a chance to come in and dominate that site. Use of herbicide, uh, chemical control is very effective. It can be cost effective. Again, use it wisely, making sure that we're following the labels and using it at the appropriate time and the appropriate uh, type of herbicide, whether it be a broad, broad spectrum, we want to kill everything that is out there or species selective, we only want to remove the grasses or only want to remove the, the, the broadleaf. Or may just be some spot treatments where we're controlling the small patches of woody vegetation coming in. Be smart about that in, in terms of making sure you're using it in the appropriate way, wearing appropriate personal protective equipment uh, and following all rules and regulations in the use of herbicide. Uh, just to show you one example, this is one field here, it's a, a pond bank. Uh, it was pretty much dominated by, by cool season grasses, a lot of fescue and, and orchard grass there on it. We came in in late April, broad spectrum glyphosate used to basically remove that carpet of grass that was there. You can see on you know, May 10th, we're seeing the, the dying of the vegetation, but a response, and this is 99% you know, milkweed, common milkweed coming back. And we went in and sprayed those grasses, get rid of them before those broadly plants were actually growing, getting rid of those cool season grasses before those those warm season plants started coming in. So you can see the response there. The grasses are gone and the major component there uh, is, is common milkweed. And, and, you know, we didn't, didn't plant anything. We just removed that carpet of cool season grass to allow the seed bank to respond. Moving on into June, you see it was dominated by uh, common milkweed there. We also had a lot of butterfly milkweed. If you were to look at this little patch and it's a, about a half an acre patch, it was 
just because we went in and killed everything with broad spectrum herbicide, we had these little strips of naturally occurring regenerating plants. We had you know, butterfly milkweed, which you see on the right hand side of the screen there, uh, made up basically one third of the field. Uh, wing stem made up the central portion of the field. And then this common milkweed made up the last third of the field. All three great beneficial. You know, these two, butterfly milkweed and common milkweed, uh, necessary for monarchs to reproduce. The wing stem, a great flowering plant in the fall of the year to buy the food source. We really couldn't have planned that any better. And that was you know, basically just uh, removing that, that, that cool season grasses out there. Again, this is that plot though, that an individual saw all of our weeds and decided, hey, we need to get rid of that for you. Again, we didn't want him to do that, but it, it worked out and, uh, and we were able to you know, regenerate those, those, that side, that section of the field. Uh, and we had that new flush of uh, young milkweed coming in to provide a, a, a substrate for monarchs to lay eggs a little bit later in the year. And also it allowed us to have these flowering plants a little bit later into the year. But we still maintain some flowering plants that are out there, uh, bit, very beneficial to our insects that are there. Again, mid-August, you can see wing stems sort of taking over there in the central portion of it, that mode section returning. So we had a lot of vegetative structure, a lot of flowering plants out there and a lot of milkweed for our monarch butterflies to lay eggs and grow on. Describe fire, another tool, uh, great at setting back succession in these early successional fields. It's, you know, it's not that easy to implement in every state. They may have rules and regulations in your state of, of if you can. I know here in West Virginia, private landowners can't use prescribed fire as a tool to, to set back succession, um, but it may be different in your state. So before you, you think about considering this tool to manage your, your pollinator fields or, or old fields, Definitely contact your natural resource agency, Division of Forestry, Division of Natural Resources, uh, DEP, whoever may be in charge of prescribed fire in your state. Make sure you have those professionals on site to help you do this the correct way. Timing and intensity of these fires can have a, a major impact on the response. It's a great effective tool to use in setting back succession, um, but, but definitely want to do this in the right way and make sure everyone's safe and we get the appropriate response for the implementation of this tool that's out there. Uh, letting people know what you're doing so they don't mow your plots, very important. Uh, also, especially if you're in urban areas or, or there's issues with messy vegetation, let them know that you're, you're doing this for a reason. You're creating pollinator habitat for them. And so uh, here on our WVU campus, there's one area that they allow to grow in some, some native vegetation so they would you know, reduce mowing on campus and they would start getting complaints. Hey, why are you not mowing that? Why are you not keeping that clean? One little sign to let them know, hey, we're creating pollinator habitat and it completely changed their, their, their mentality that, oh, it's great, I'm, I'm glad you're doing this for pollinators now. So letting them know why you're allowing this vegetation to grow, very important, not only to protect it, but also it's, it's an educational tool, let people know that the needs of our wildlife species out there across the landscape. Uh, if you're thinking about establishing a pollinator field, it depends on, on what you have out there. Um, some things to consider, this is taken from Brownstone Native Seed Company, they developed a little list of, you know, sort of five, five things to consider, five elements of successful pollinator habitat, proper planning, making sure you know where this is going to go, what you're going to plant, when you're going to plant it. Competition control, number two, is very important because you don't want to put a lot of seed out there and then have it overtaken by you know, the native seed bank or some of the other invasive species that we may have there. So, so making sure that we have a, a, a clean palette to work with, clean plate to work with, and allow our seeds that we're planting in there to grow. Again, seeding method, how we, how we put these seeds into the seed, uh, to the seed bank, when we're going to do it, and, and seeding rates. Um, a, lot, a lot of issues we, we, we see from time to time that if, if, if uh, general recommendations are 10 pounds per acre, then 20 must be double as good, right? That's just, that's just, that's just much better. And not always the case. You want know, to make sure we're using the appropriate seeding rates, uh, seed timing, make sure that, you know, we don't want it to be over-vegetated. Other wildlife species can get in there and move around if there's a little bit of bare soil left on the site. And other insects can use that for, for bedding areas or, or overwintering sites as well. Um, making sure you're selecting appropriate plants and species in your region. Uh, and, and make sure you understand seed quality. Not all, all seed mixes are created equally. Um, some of those, you know, you, you really get what you pay for. Some of those cheap seed mixes may have some other materials in it, some noxious weeds in it, some invasive species in it, or just not have the germination rates that a high quality seed may have. So make sure you understand where your seeds are coming from and make sure you're using appropriate uh, seed for your ecoregion. Uh, and also stay in maintenance. Once you have this planted, um, 
and making sure that you're going in and managing it correctly so you can maintain that over time. Yeah. When I'm talking to landowners and they're saying, hey, I want to plant this pollinator field or these pollinator plants, my first, my first warning to them is to be patient. A lot of our plants will take multiple years to actually establish and take hold. You'll hear the terms, you know, first it sleeps, then it creeps, then it leaps. First year, you know, these things are just putting the root system down in the ground. You're really not seeing the flowering that the stem from above ground just yet. Year two, you start to see it, but it's still, still slow. In year three, that's when you really start seeing the response. You see those, those, those plants, the fruits of your labor now uh, coming up. So but be patient. Don't think that you failed if you don't see all, you know, just all flowering plants coming up in the first year. It may take time for some of those plants to actually come in and become established. So be patient in some of those areas. It's not just our pollinators that are benefiting. Yes, monarchs will benefit, bees, other insects will benefit, but many of our wildlife species will benefit from this type of vegetation. It's early successional pollinator fields, um, flower heavy fields. Uh, it's going to produce a lot of insects, which is good. We're providing it all in for them, that forage and, and the feed for them. But those insects are also going to feed some of our other species, such as our game birds, the eastern wild turkey, eastern cottontail, they're in the center, and our not non game birds, such as the uh, just went blank on that bird species right there, which is not good. That's, that's, that's bad. Uh, geez, it'll come to me in a minute on what species that is. That's shameful, isn't it? Wildlife, wildlife bombs can't, uh, can't think of that species. But even in our uh, best laid plans, we can have some issues there. This is a friend of mine up just across the border in Pennsylvania. Wonderful pollinator habitat, milkweeds everywhere, flowering plants everywhere. Uh, and then he had one garden spider establish a nest right around this milkweed and started knocking down monarchs as they were coming in to feed and started eating those, uh, which is, which is uh, you know, again, best laid plans. Sometimes other things come in uh, and, and issues occur. Um, but again, across the board, a lot of pollinator habitat in that area um, and, and great response from the pollinators that were there. Get involved. Uh, a lot of citizen science projects just to start monitoring. You know, we can go out there and have master gardener, master naturalist workshops in terms of uh, master landowner, woodland owner workshops to, to get you out there and, 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 and start working in the fields and planting these species and monitoring these species. We have uh, Monarch Watch where they're actually tagging uh, monarch butterflies. You can get involved with your local schools and um, after capturing some of the, the caterpillars and then tagging the adults as we release them. Uh, this is uh, just a, another way that we can get involved uh, and gather more information about these migratory pathways and more migratory more information about the, their migration patterns as, as they're flying back down to Mexico. One of ours, we, a local school here released a, a tagged monarch, um, I think it was 2018, and it was found down in North Carolina uh, on its way down. It was hit by a car, unfortunately, but uh, um, definitely uh, we can get together some more information of where these individuals are flying through uh, by these citizen science projects. And it's just good to get out there and, and enjoy. Other things you can do, you know, educate yourself. Uh, start identifying these plants. Here's, here's some more of that homework for you. Start learning the plants and how to identify those plants in your backyard. What are the plants that are most beneficial to whatever species you want to promote, whether it be monarch or, or other insects or the wildlife species. And then identifying those insects. Those are, you know, we focus mainly on the monarch butterfly today. We have many other insects and, and butterflies. Um, and, and bees that are out there. So, so get out there with a field guide and learn what else, what other, other species may be using your area. Don't think that you're alone in this and use that available help. You know, I work for WU Extension Service and so each of you probably have a county uh, extension officer close by with a lot of knowledge in these plants and agricultural systems and how we can plant and grow things. Take, take advantage of that. Your, your uh, visual natural resources, your game agencies, your wildlife agencies in your state, division of foresters in your state. Take advantage of those resources and, and learn more about how we can effectively manage the landscape, not just for, for pollinators, but other wildlife species as well. Develop a plan. You know, you know, set, set your goals and objectives in, in writing and say, how do I get, how do I meet these goals and objectives? And what steps should I take to make sure uh, that I do reach these goals? And again, this is not going to be fixed. This issue is not going to be fixed by just individual landowners that are out there. Uh, but talk to your neighbors and, 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 and let's start you know, creating this larger landscape of, of pollinator habitat or just improved wildlife habitat across the area. 
Uh, the more area we have involved and the more areas that we have that are producing these flowering plants, the better off our, our pollinators will be and our other wildlife species will be as well. Uh, there are numerous um, pollinator, insect, wildlife resources that are out there on the landscape. Xerxes Society, so if you're interested in, in not only monarchs but other pollinating uh, insects, great resources. Uh, citizen science programs is uh, concerning monarch watch, celebrating wildflowers. Uh, if you have your natural resource conservation service in your area, there are some cost share programs available, potentially uh, available in your area. Contact them and see what you may be eligible for. Uh, see if there's some call share programs and some monies that you can get to, to create and put um, pollinator habitat back on the landscape. Why not joint venture? A lot of resources here that you, um, if you can, if you've logged on to, uh, to this webinar, as soon as this is over with, get on there and start looking up some of the other resources that are available out there for you. Uh, take advantage of those. It's, again, it's a learning opportunity but also great resources out there to help you better manage your property, your woodlands, your fields, uh, for whatever wildlife species you may be interested in. All right, Peter, I think that's, that runs us to about the 50 minute mark. We've got some time for questions before everyone is finished with lunch and go their, uh, go their happy ways. How do we uh, uh, stop sharing? Can we see those questions or you just want to call them out? Uh-oh. Peter, hopefully you're still there. Yeah, yeah, we're off the top there. Yeah, American Goldfinch, thanks. I, on the tip of my tongue, I couldn't get it to come out. Um, that was American Goldfinch, that's sad, isn't it? I've worked with mammals most of my day. I should know that one, I've got those in my backyard. Can you hear me, Sheldon? I've got you now. Okay, I pushed the mute button on my microphone. Uh -oh. I had all kinds of profound things I was saying too, and nobody <laughs> heard. <laughs> I, I believe you, brother. Yeah, believe. right. Yeah, yeah. You work with that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so you can you see the questions? Did you scroll back towards the top? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. We want to start at the top there. So uh, looks like someone did point out. Thanks for for. I had a little. I haven't eaten lunch yet, so maybe I lost that. Uh, I should have had my Snickers bar so I could remember that was American Goldfinch. Uh, all right. So look. All the states. Yeah. So twelve oh five. Cynthia wants to know if honeybees are native or non-native. Non-native. Now there there are some bees that are native, most definitely, but most of our honeybees are European honeybees, the so non-native species. Okay. Um, Gary's wondering about the source of the data for the 40% pollinator extin extinction. Uh, I'll have to go back and look. A lot of this is, is coming through. It's a lot of piecemeal. So Xerxes Society has information on, on pollinator decline. Uh, NRCS has information on pollinator decline. So piecing a lot of those together. I don't have the source for that, um, but I can find that for you. Okay. Lee wants to know if the monarch uses any flowering trees or shrubs. They will. Now, any, you know, think about, about button bush would be, be a great one that's out there. Any of our plants that, that have flowers and it can you know, hold up a monarch butterfly, they're going to feed off of. Um, now, they again, they have to have milkweed to lay their eggs and those larvae to live on, but any of our other flowering plants could potentially benefit our monarch butterflies. Okay. Do you, Gary's wondering if you have a sense about how the use of neonicotinoids have changed over time, or the increasing, decreasing? I, I think because of the awareness now is starting to decrease, um, but you can still see that the, those little uh, tags in our, in our plants, if you're thinking about buying something at your local garden store, you'll see those uh, neonicotinoid tags letting people know that they are still using it. Uh, I think because of the the uh, amount of information that is out there uh, and the awareness now of our decline in, 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 in pollinators, I think we're seeing a decrease in that use, which is good. Okay. Uh, James has a question about the if, whether there's a benefit for wildfire. You mentioned prescribed burning. Yep. I guess there's not, I don't know yep. if you want to differentiate between wildfire and prescribed burning and how this might affect um, pollinators in general or mo monarchs specifically? 
Yeah, if, if we're talking about a wildfire, you're talking about, you know, the, the sort of uh, major uh, catastrophic fires in some cases, if that's how we want to define it, uh, can have significant impact, especially if it, it takes out large areas of vegetation, which are, uh, depending on the timing, you know, if, you're, it's, if it's during the summer months when these, these uh, insects are flying through, you know, and that's their only food source, it can have a significant impact. And now the use of controlled burns or, or prescribed fires, again, these are, are mostly used outside of that growing season or outside of the season when those insects will be using uh, those flowering plants. So it may be in the fall of the year after, after the, the insects have already, uh, in particular monarchs, have already flown, flown south for the winter or before early in the spring before those insects start to emerge. Uh, and so there's definitely a difference in wildfire and the use of prescribed fire. It's a more controlled fire with a specific purpose in mind. You know, we're going to just set back the vegetation out there and it's not out of control. It's actually maintained and used as a tool uh, to remove that, the, the leaf litter or the, the, the thatch, the vegetation is there. And also maybe kill some undesirable species that may be used in that area. So definitely a difference between a wildfire and a prescribed fire there. Uh, but, but fire in terms of setting back succession can be beneficial. Uh, again, we, we like to use those as a bit more controlled uh, than just the use of a wildfire. So an interesting kind of spin on that aside from the fire is the importance of understanding the, the, the local breeding cycle of monarchs. You know, in your work, where you are in West Virginia is going to be a little bit different than where we are in southern New York and where other people are might be in, and we have folks from Michigan and Montana and in Vermont and, and all over. So Absolutely. and some of the, some of the questions that come up later, I think are going to maybe get into more of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 se the, the seasonality of treatments relative to the life cycle of the organism. Absolutely. Very important. Not only understand the natural history of species, when they're showing up, when, they're, when they need these resources, and, and when the best time is to implement some of these tools. But taking all that into consideration, you're right. Those, I think I saw someone from Arizona, definitely going to be a lot different from the, the person up in Maine in terms of the timing. <laughs> yeah. So keep that in mind as we're going through. Yeah. So John's wondering when uh, he attempts to break up the cool season um, grasses, any strategies or ways to think about managing the non-native invasive species that might also try to come in? Yeah, that's definitely an issue. And, and I, the ability to identify those and make sure that you're addressing those when they do start to arrive, because you do not want those invasive species, non-native invasives to take over an area. Uh, and so it depends on which species comes in. It may be a mechanical treatment, such as disking to get rid of it, or you may have to use a chemical control, some type of herbicide to actually get rid of it. But, but yeah, we want to definitely pretty much anywhere you, you work with monarchs, you're going to have to battle non-native invasive species. And so making sure that you understand, you know, you can identify those species and which techniques and tools you need to actually control and, and get rid of those species are very important. Okay. Um, Gene has, uh, makes reference to an article by Baker and Potter mm -hmm. on the configuration and location of small urban gardens and how that affects the colonization of monarch butterflies. Are you familiar, she wants to know if you're familiar with that and have any comment on it. I, I'm not, but actually, you know, location, location, location is key. A lot of the work we're doing, you, you see milkweeds and a lot of poly, uh, pollinator friendly plants growing up along our roadways. And the big issue is you're driving down any interstate, you're hitting a lot of insects as you drive down through there. So is that the best location to actually put those? Any habitat is very important. You know, any, any pollinated plants out there are important. Um, and so the configuration, how these things are, are laid down across the landscape definitely have an impact on how these, these insects move through and migrate through um, and, and can have an impact. I haven't read that paper. Uh, but, but it's definitely important to understand how your piece of property fits into the greater landscape in terms of what is connected to, what's surrounding your property, um, and, and how that's going to benefit the surrounding property as well. Irene wants to know if blackberry bushes are suitable as monarch habitat. They, they can be. Uh, it's another flowering plant that is out there. Uh, they will benefit from that. You know, other, other wildlife species benefit from that. It's a great cover. Uh, for our eastern cottontail, uh, great forage for eastern cottontails and, and, and white-tailed deer that are out there. So it provides cover and structure for many of other birds as well. Uh, so it's, it's a great species um, for, you know, flowering plant for those insects. However, 
uh, again, if we're specific to monarchs, um, we're going to need some more milkweeds in addition to that. All right. So Jules is wondering if you can, uh, if, you, if you're familiar with, if anybody's made an effort to try to estimate monarch populations pre-European settlement um, and, and how that changed in response to the land, the large scale land clearing. Um, I, you know, I'm not familiar with that, but definitely, you know, look at the past 150 years, just it, the changes in land use uh, practices that are out there and how that's going to impact them. So um, for European settle settlement, I don't know of the numbers of monarch butterflies. I haven't seen those. I don't know if that information is out there. It, it may be. I can't speak to that, but definitely our land use, historical land use practices and, and future land use practices are, are definitely going to impact um, habitat out there across the landscape. So related to that, and this is a tangent that you'd shown the the, re, the uptick last year in the mm -hmm. abundance of the monarchs. Is that just, is that is that attributable to something that you know of? I mean, it's obviously good news, but is there, is it just random variation in the population or was there some effort that was building over the last two or three years that you think might be responsible for that? You know, specifically pointing at one thing, I don't know. Obviously, you know, there's more information coming out now. There's more uh, management practices on the landscape to promote pollinators. Um, weather patterns were, were pretty good for those two years. You know, it wasn't, wasn't, any major storms during the migration period. So I think all of that was is attributable to that. But again, wait to see the, you know this year's numbers come out. Let's see, let's see how we're doing. Hopefully we're continuing on that up uptick trend. Um, but I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll have to see. Um, it's, it's a good start, but but let's hope it's let's hope that our management practices are, are, are having an impact. Um, but there's there's probably more to it than just you know the increased number of milkweed plants that are out there on the landscape. Okay. So John wants to promote milkweed without herbicides, and you had mentioned things like disking mm -hmm. and mowing and uh, prescribed fires. Are, are there? I mean, those are presumably the options that are available, or is there other uh, ways to? There are some other organic matters to do that. You know, in terms of um, uh, putting plastic down to actually, you know, solarization to to kill some of those weeds that are there. Uh, and, and sort of combating those the competition that is out there. Um, they're you know if you're not looking for chemical control and just allowing these things to grow. These you know milkweeds can grow through some of our uh, cool season grass thatch that is out there. Those cool season carpets and so these things are going to grow. Uh, if you have milkweeds in the area or you can plant seeds, you can purchase plugs. Uh, if you're just putting that out there on the landscape in terms of just letting it, letting it grow. Uh, you wouldn't have to resort to herbicides to, to maintain that unless there's some of the competition uh, that is taking over. There are some non-chemical ways that you can manage it in terms of uh, solarization, which is an or, uh, organic way to do that, um, or just mechanical disturbance in terms of uh, using a, a disc or something to break up that, that, that seed, seed bed. Okay. Uh, Jules just shared a comment about the timing of mowing as the milkweed was below the height of the mower, mm -hmm. um, but then still being able to chop off the tops of some of the competitors. And that's, Jules is here in uh, central upstate New York. Yep, yep. Um, Again, that, somewhat a mechanical way to, to sort of manage the competition that is out there, allowing, you know, you know, cutting it back while you're still allowing those milkweeds to grow, very important. Okay. Then Mike has a question that uh, specifically is about finding that balance and maybe this is some of the seasonality of of mm -hmm. the life cycle of the butterflies but finding that balance between mowing that supports butterflies and mowing that supports ground nesting birds absolutely again and you know we're, we're talking specifically today about monarchs and, and, and pollinators and so that may be a different mowing strategy or, or, or management strategy uh, than you would be for uh, protecting these uh, ground nesting birds. Uh, you know, you're cut off, you're generally thinking if we're, if we're trying to protect or leave areas undisturbed for, for many of our neotropical migrants and our birds is that kind of that July 15th time frame. Most of those are, you know, they're, they're fledged young and either you know, second nest maybe are already starting to fly back south about that July 15th time frame. But again, you can use that uh, to, to implement your mowing strategy if you wanted to. Um, and, and again, not mowing everything down at once, just maybe clipping some small areas uh, 
and then allowing some other vegetation for those birds that are still in the area. Yeah, there's trade-offs. Um, things that we do may negatively impact other species. Uh, it just depends on, on what we're trying to promote and what your objectives are for your property. Uh, but, but good question, definitely keep that in mind. So in terms of birds and butterflies, would a fall mowing like October and November be reasonable? Would that accomplish, it's gonna disrupt the woodies, the yeah. herbaceous plants have already set and thrown seeds. So mm -hmm. is that uh, like a, a fall mowing? How would that be? I think I think you if you move it to, you know, sort of late spring right before green up, because you know that structure that is out there is gonna provide cover and, and, and maybe some of the dead seed heads that are still out there that may provide food for other wildlife species that use it over winter. And so if you go in with a clean slate, you know, in the fall, uh, if you're, you're kind of removing some of that cover and maybe another food source for those overwintering birds uh, and, and other wildlife species that may be using that area. So if you can move it back to late winter, early spring before, you know, green up of these things to, to remove some of that thatch or remove some of those dead stems will probably be better than, than a late October mowing. Okay. Uh, Mike's wondering about the problems of spotted knapweed for pollinators and if this is something that that owners and managers should try to control or is it just something that's there? It, it, you know, the catch-all answer is, is it depends. Uh, we, we, we love to have this argument uh, between us here at WVU. You know, we, we would always promote our native species, our native plant species over non-natives. But if all you have are exotic non-native species and they are providing, they're still providing some form of, of food out there, maybe a flowering plant, um, then it, it, is that better than nothing at all? So uh, it depends on your situation. If you can control it and then replace it with a native plant, uh, native flowering plant, it would be better. Um, but if, but if, you know, if that's all you've got and you can't go in and control it or, or, or you, that would be taking it out of habitat for insects, then maybe leaving it is not so bad. Uh, but again, all of our, most of our non-native invasive species are going to take over an area. And so unless you want a whole field or whole area of that particular species, you know, spotted knapweed in those cases, um, definitely, definitely consider that. Okay. Leslie has been rearing mon monarchs for many years in the Hudson Valley of New York, so just north of New York City. And she sees that this is one of the last places that monarchs arrive. And if you have any thoughts on why Again, this is a, a late arrival location. Yeah, if, and it really depends. If you, know, if you look, if the farther north it is, the longer it's going to take for those monarchs to get back. Uh, so maybe even the, the, the farther east you go, northeast you go, the longer it's going to take for those the monarchs to make it back into your area. Specific to the to Hudson Valley, I'm not sure if there's anything else that's uh, keeping them from coming into those areas or arriving in those areas, other than just the distance it is from their overwintering grounds uh, in, in Mexico. Okay, uh, Jessica says that last summer she reared uh, or collected 40 eggs from milkweed gardens, raised them to adults, um, and then released, but she tested each one for OE. I'm not gonna try to pronounce that. Yeah. Offer, offer a cystus. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about, Sheldon? <laughs> Before right, I try. Is, that, is that the parasite? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing it's a parasite, though, because those okay. two were positive and but were euthanized. And just wondering about your, she's wondering about your comments on this controversial method of monarch control. Yeah, in terms of yeah, I'm not sure with the the, the OE there that she's referring to in terms of what impact that's having. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot of other predators out there as well. You know, because of the you know, feeding on milkweed, these the monarch caterpillars and butterflies are considered toxic to a lot of species and they don't feed on them, but there are some parasitizing uh, stink bugs that are out there that feed on them, other insects that feed on them. Obviously saw the picture of that garden spider that was feeding on them. Um, and so there are other naturalisms out there that, that have an impact on our monarch butterflies. And so it's, it's part, of, part of their biological system in those cases. So sorry, is she referring to uh, euthanizing the, the controversial method of euthanizing those monarchs because they are infected with it. I'm. Um, I assume it's the question about um, surveying for whatever this parasite yeah. is. I'll say. I'll say it's a parasite. Um, 
surveying for it at all. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming if it's, if it's a contagious condition mm -hmm. and it's problematic for the, for the monarchs, there's value in doing it. Yeah, yeah, and but I'm not sure the the, the controversy that comes behind it. I, I'm not sure about that one. We need to bring in a, a true monarch specialist to talk more about that. Okay, than I can. okay. all right. Um, Bonnie says she has a healthy milkweed area in her garden. Tried to plant seeds in other areas and they don't seem to take. Can you offer any suggestions on essentially the cultivation of milkweeds and how do you get? new milkweed started yeah th this can be difficult again looking at your seed source and so uh, proper scarification of those seeds you know if you, you collect them in the fall you know keep them in a cool place over winter uh, and then plant them not too deep uh, you know in in the summer months most of these seeds especially our pollinator mixes only need to be about an eighth of an inch into the soil so if you're sticking them down uh, you know an inch down they may not germinate there are a lot of different things that, that, that could come into play there um, there are, you know, uh, milk weed plugs that are available through various sources um, that, that could be available that you could plant out there. But sometimes I have a lot of, um, a lot of uh, cooperatives here that are having an issue growing milkweed seeds as well, getting them to, to actually germinate and establish out in the wild. Of course, this stuff grows up, you know, common milkweeds are rhizominous. Basically, one plant will start every year, start more will start growing from the roots and so it can expand and take over an area with, with just one plant um, but it's hard to get some of those seeds to establish but um, look online at some of the, the resources for, for Xerxes and Monarch Watch in terms of how they are recommending you treat the seeds over when of the seeds uh, and, and plant those seeds to get some more specific information on, on when and how to plant those. Okay. John's wondering that because there's so much variation from location to location in the uh, life cycle of the monarchs, is there something other than calendar dates that can be used? I mean, how do you kind of cue key into the, to the local cycle of things? Yeah, you know, again, there's, there's always these fluctuations. It's, it's, uh, these flights are on uh, basically day, daytime length or sunlight. Um, and so that's when they start keying in of when they're going to start migrating south and uh, when, they, you know, when it's warm enough for them to fly back north. And, and you know, it may take you know, weather patterns for them to make it actually back up here. So again, notice there's some general times in terms of times of the month that, that you know they start arriving throughout these regions. Um, so it's it's really just really getting to know and and, and watching out there on the landscape. As, you know, I've seen monarchs here in uh, in April and May, which seems pretty early for them to be arriving back here in West Virginia. So it really just depends on the year. So look at some of the weather weather patterns of when they may start arri arriving. So they could be you know, arriving early. Uh, so just make sure there are they're flowering plants out there year round. So when they do get here, they have something to feed on. Uh, and then the insects that are that arrive before them or emerge before them uh, will also have something to feed on as well. Okay, Bruce wants to know what is a cool season grass? Uh, so like fescue, uh, tall fescue, orchard grass, velvet grass, timothy, some of our blue grasses, Smooth brome may be another example of a cool season grass. These are just those that grow better during the cooler periods. And so they, they grow best during uh, the spring of the year and the fall of the year. And sometimes they can stay green over winter, depending on how harsh the, you know, the winter climate is. So they just grow best in cooler temperatures. Compare that to a warm season grass, which grows during the summer months or during the warmer, warmer they don't germinate and they don't, they don't grow until it's much warmer during the summer months. So if you're looking throughout the year, our cool season grasses sort of regress during the summer months when it's too hot and then come back in the fall of the year when it cools down. And then during that, those hot, warm summer months are when our warm season plants and grasses uh, are, are really taking off and expanding. And if they have, if somebody has not done something to specifically grow warm season grasses, is, is it safe to assume that most of the grasses that are established in most pastures and field edges are probably cool season or or is there a decent mixture of cool and warm season it, it depends on your area in most cases and you know generally speaking i don't know where they are here in the northeast you know most of our fields and stuff have been planted and and, and most of our are promoted in those cool season grasses uh, we do have some some other warm season grasses that are out there uh side oats gamma 
uh, big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass that, that are be, going to be growing out there, those warm season grasses. So it really depends on the area where you are in, in what else is there, the management history of that, that location. So if they were unsure, could they talk like with a soil and water conservation, like a forage yeah. specialist with their cooperative extension or soil and water or something like that? Yeah, yeah. There's some great identification guides online. Uh, I would contact your local extension office to see if they could come out and help you identify those or conservation districts. Uh, they have some forage specialists at, at probably all of your universities and plant specialists there. Uh, and probably some ID guides that could help you identify those grasses that you have or plants that you have growing in your area. Okay. All right. Uh, what about the milkweed tussock moth and whether that's of concern? Now, you know, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, so I, I, I can't, I don't know if that's a, it's an issue or not. Um, so I don't know the natural history of that. That's, a, that's some, some more homework for me now to start learning about that one. Okay. Uh, so here's a follow-up on the OE. It's a protozoan parasite that can spread and significantly weaken monarch populations. So the question is whether you think that citizens raising monarchs by hand, if it's a good idea, um, presumably <laughs> because by raising them, you may be increasing this yeah. parasite. So yeah. kind of how so, that... Because, you know, what's, there's a, uh, I don't know what the word is, there's a phrase that I'm <laughs> not coming up with. Yeah. It was like two, so getting getting involved maybe, but the negative consequences of that. Yeah, and, it, and you know, there has been a couple of papers that have come out here recently talking about sort of the, uh, the commercial raising of, of monarch butterflies, and that may be where it comes into play. Uh, when, when we're collecting monarchs for you know, classroom demonstrations and things, we're collecting those there locally on site. Uh, and so we're not taking them from one place to another in case this parasite is there uh, or any other pathogen, any other issue. We're not spreading it from site to site. So we're, we're establishing uh, little fields and, and milkweed areas around these schools where they're having the insects and, and the uh, monarchs lay caterpillars there close by so we can take them in. You know, that's, that's another option that commercially raised that may be where the, the spread of this, this parasite may be coming in. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read those papers yet to really talk about it, but um, it definitely may not be um, the best route to take in terms of the commercialization of this and you know, commercial raising of these insects and releasing them out there. I think our you know, promoting the habitat for them, the natural habitat for them out there uh, is probably our best step in, in, in promoting the species. Okay, great. Well, and that's all of the questions. We hit a high of 196 um, oh. that I saw on the screen, but I see here Abigail had her two and a half year old who enjoyed the picture. So that's really 197. All right. Were present. So great, uh, great, great job, Sheldon. I appreciate that. And I want to thank everybody for some fabulous questions. This was a fun conversation. Absolutely. Um, and